Well, I have. It's a blend of old and new technology. Uh, diaphragmatic absorption has been around for years. We all have diaphragmatic absorbers in our homes, in our houses. If you live in the United States, wood frame construction, airspace filled with building insulation separated by two hard surfaces with higher densities. That's a diaphragmatic absorber. What, at what frequency? Well, you calculate the depth. The density, there's formulas for all of that, but it's not low frequency, that's for certain. And so diaphragmatic absorption is a process of absorption that really works well for low frequencies. Doesn't work well for middle and high frequencies. So we chose diaphragmatic absorption because, yes, it's been around 40 or 50 or 100 years, who knows how long, but it's very powerful, pound for pound, and it's heavy. You can't get any better performance, and we were all about performance-driven, because I'm tired of sitting in small rooms. I'm tired of paying for the mistakes of small room acoustics, especially in the low end. I'm tired of the low end smothering and blurring the middle and high frequencies. I'm tired of all that. I want to get rid of that bass bloat, that bloom, if you will, that smothers and blurs everything. So we chose diaphragmatic absorption. Now, diaphragmatic absorption needs some kick to it. It needs some hot sauce, if you will, on, on the salad, but it needs a boost. So we took it and we increased densities and then we did something that's very, very unique. We took away the single wall and put in two walls. Standard diaphragmatic absorbers have one wall. Your wall inside your room is a standard diaphragmatic absorber. One piece of drywall, stud, another piece of drywall. So that, that's a diaphragmatic absorber with one wall. Just count the wall on one surface. We found out, what is the purpose of the front wall? The purpose of the front wall is to slow that long wave down, because it's a huge pressure wave, like a wave on the ocean. So we want to erect this huge monument in front of the wave, and we found that one wall worked, but two walls worked 30% better. 30% better by adding another wall. Now the key is to get the densities of both walls correct. The mounting method is of both walls, because you've got to allow one to move more than the other. So there's a vibrational pattern sympathy, if you will. So these two walls work together in synergy to act like one really thick wall. I guess would be a way to say it. So you slow the energy down better with the two front walls. You make the cabinet more rigid, which does two things, forces the front wall to vibrate more, because and if it moves more, the wave slows down more. And then when the wave does enter the inside of the cabinet, with the rigid cabinet, you, you slow it down even further. You don't get it all. <laughs> Most of it runs out the back and sides. But you can get a lot of it especially when you add activated carbon to the inside. Now, we tried all the standard fill materials. We've tried 14 or 15 different combinations. But activated carbon only was the only one that gave us, in the initial parts, the vibrational readings we wanted, because you can tell rate and level absorption through vibrational readings on the cabinet itself. Seven-layer cabinet, th this is the kind of wall you would want if you had a noisy neighbor, because this would keep a lot of the sound out from that noisy neighbor, no matter how loud they got. But the carbon is very, very special. One gram, 2,000 square meters of absorption surface area. Are you kidding me? 2,000 square meters in a teaspoon of activated carbon? Give me something that has better specs than that because that's incredible. Now, what happens when you take 65 pounds of it and put inside our ACDA10 or ACDA12 units? You get tremendous rates and levels of absorption. The ACDA12, our big low frequency sponge, 30%, 35% at 30 cycles, 63% at 40, and 100% at 50. 63% at 40. With that unit, you have 
of the very good possibility and reality of tuning your room flat to 40 cycles. Nobody's got a product out there that you can do that with. Now, granted, you're going to need a lot of units, but you can achieve the result. And this is what I'm talking about, manufacturers making extra efforts to really go after the problem. Am I happy with the performance of our activated carbon low-frequency units? Absolutely. Am I happy with how much they weigh? Nope. And we're working on that. You know, if we can lower the, the mass and the density and still keep the performance, but I won't sacrifice performance. Because now we have a tool that can actually achieve a flat frequency response in your room. Down to 30 cycles, 35 cycles, 40 cycles. You can't do that unless you build a new studio. So these are very, very powerful tools. So this is the effort we put forth. Um, I had eight men. I had eight years. And I worked uh, to develop this technology. I built 116 rooms, and I tested them all, acoustically, vibrationally, structurally. So I have a really good handle on what rooms, what sizes, and what construction methods produce what sound. Wow, how nice is that? Well, they don't do a similar job. They do a similar job, they just don't do it as well. They don't go as low. They don't have the rates and levels that we have. And let's jump back a little bit and realize that bass is not trapped by anything. You cannot trap a 30-cycle, 30 39-foot wave with anything. I have built rooms with two 8-inch thick poured concrete walls with a 6-inch airspace. And I still get 30, 40 cycle bleed. So let's be realistic when we use such terms. And let's be careful with using the term base trap because low frequency energy is not trapped by anything. The best you can hope for is proper management with correct rates and levels of absorption. That's all we can do with current science and technology. So our products into the marketplace are the first step in really producing a powerful product that can solve a much, much needed issue. Base is not trapped by anything. And it takes special technology to trap base. You can't use limp mass, quarter wavelength rule practices and fill boxes full of building insulation and in eight or 10 inches of depth, get anything that's going to be a base trap in terms of 30, 40, 50 cycle performance. It's just not possible with the laws of physics that we have, and it's just not something that we, we really need to do. And there's a lot of manufacturers out there that call their products base traps. And if we define base as less than 100 cycles, which is how we define it, because anything above 100 cycles can be dealt with inside the room rather easily with current technology, it's below 100 cycles that nobody's come up with a real answer for. That's the problem, because it takes lots of money and lots of R&D. It's much easier to have a product that's a middle and uh, mid-band absorber and label it base trap. Well, it's not. and, and this is another thing like the room that people are, are not understanding and it's frustrating. And, you know, you can, I see in the forums a lot of times that uh, people comment back and say, well, just add more of this or more of that. Why would you add more of something to solve a problem that can never be, be solved by the design parameters of that unit? Why would you add any more units? Why would you even add that unit in the first place? Okay, so that unit has a frequency response range of X. We use that to solve X problem. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that unit can also be termed a base trap. Because it can't. It just can't. And that's what prompted us to build our diaphragmatic absorbers. Take existing technology and basically hot rod it. And we did a really good job. Wait till you see our new series. They'll be 25% lighter and perform 10 to 15% better. That's our design goal with our next go around.
make it lighter on everybody's backs. Well, because the person is never going to be happy because the issues that the manufacturers are claiming put this unit here and this unit there will solve won't. It's just an attempt to sell product <coughs> that no matter how much product you put in won't work. When we built our rooms, and we built 116 rooms over eight years, and then we got stepped back and looked at all the data, patterns begin to emerge because we measured a lot of variables vibrational variables, acoustic variables, reverb, decay times, all of these really important variables. I'm going to look at you. It's easier. Um, all of these important variables. And so then when we were consistent in measuring all these variables, we put all the data together and we looked at it and we realized that there were three groups of rooms acoustically. There were three major characteristics in this data. There was a group below a certain volume and size that had so many acoustical room distortions that even treating them all, you, you're not going to win. You, you might be able to treat 50% of the issues, but you'll never get the other half because you're fighting an uphill battle because of room size. So in the forums I see all the time is people always have a certain room size and, and guys are saying, well, just use this or just fill it. No, it's never going to be right. It can't be right. You're doing a disservice to this customer and person because he's going to spend all this money and you're going to solve some of the issues that bother him. Keep your fingers crossed that you're going to solve more of them. He doesn't want his money back. That's nonsense. Stop that. Take all the energy the person would put in designing his room, and we all know that's a time-consuming process, and find a different room in the same structure or house. Sometimes it only needs to be a foot or two foot difference that can make a 60% difference in room acoustics. So no is no. No means no. And we have the benefit of knowing what room size and what volumes are no. And I never get a chance to go in the forums, but my partner Mike does. And he knows from looking at the data, because he's a structural engineer, he did the vibrational testing. He knows that, look, if you've got a room this size in our database that's below a certain size and volume, no, stop. The problems, the acoustics, the distortions are too great for modern technology to solve. That's the bottom line. Well, if it's too great for existing technologies, including ours, to solve, get away from it. If you can't get good sound because the bad sound is so great, go somewhere else. Then we found another group of rooms that were good for voice, but not good for music. Because there are two different spectrums of the frequency range. There are two different, completely different things. Speech intelligibility and reflection management within the room to achieve speech intelligibility is way different than reflection management in the room when you're playing music. This is another thing people don't understand. Voice and music are completely different. We even have separate scales that we use for measurement. Well, that said, voicing is still part of the process. And this is the reason I designed the foam, you know, for vocals, because there's a certain sensitivity that male and female vocals have. And you can't just use any response curve to achieve that. You just can't. So that, that's the, uh, the deal there.